Moving on to the next question, we're going to be dealing with inverses in this video. So let's say we're given a function f of x equals 4 bracket x minus 2 squared plus 3. Part A, we have to sketch both f of x and its inverse. Part B, we have to find the equation of the inverse. Part C, is the inverse a function? And then part D, we have to state the domain and range of the inverse. So let's start off by sketching f of x because once we have f of x sketched, Sketching the inverse is pretty simple. We just switch the x and y coordinates. So this is the function that we have to graph. And as you can tell, the parent function is y is equal to x squared, right? Because of this exponent 2 here. And then we're taking this parent function and we are transforming it to y is equal to 4 x minus 2 squared plus 3. All right, so notice how it's not, the transform function is not in general form. There's not like a f of x in the transform part. It's already given specifically in terms of the parent function x squared. So let's start off by making a table of value for x squared. So we got negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. 4, 1, 0, 1, and 4. And then what's going to happen is we have to take these points and we have to transform them with the formula x over k plus d a y plus c. So we have to figure out what are the transformation values. What's the k value, d value, a value, c value. So let's do that on the side here. So looking at this function here, we can tell the a value is 4. Notice how there's nothing in front of the x. So the k value is just 1. The d value is positive 2. Remember for the d value, you always take the opposite sign. So it's a negative 2 here. d value is going to be positive 2 because the general formula, if you remember, it has x minus d. So x minus 2, x minus d, d is equal to 2. And then the c value is 3. Okay, so now that we have those specific values for our transformation, what we can do is we can now create a table for the transform function using this formula. So what we would do is we would take all the x values, divide them by k, which is just 1. So x divided by 1 is just x by itself. So let me just write a bigger x here. And then plus d, well, the d value is 2. So we're just taking all of these x values here, and we're going to just add 2 to them. And then a y plus c, we would have 4y plus 3, c value of 3. So let's uh, go through the x values first. So all we're doing to all the x values is we're taking them and then adding 2. So negative 2 plus 2 is 0. Negative 1 plus 2 is 1. 0 plus 2 is 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. And then 2 plus 2 is 4. And then for the y values, what we're doing is we're taking them, multiplying them by 4, and then adding 3. Okay, so 4 times 4 plus 3 gives us 19. Uh, 1 times 4 plus 3 gives us 7. 0 times 4 is 0 plus 3 gives us 3. And then it's just going to be symmetrical the other way because notice how the y values here are the same as in the first half. So we're going to get 7 and 19. Remember, for the parent function x squared, notice how the y values here are symmetrical. So the y values in your transformed function have to be symmetrical as well. If they're not, then you know you did something wrong and you should go back, perhaps check your formula or check your algebra for the y values when you actually transform them. So now that we have the table of values for this transform function, we can take these points and then plot them on the graph, and that would give us the sketch for f of x. So 0 and 19, that would be somewhere up here. 1 and 7, 
let's say it's uh, down here, two and three, right here, three and seven, and then four and 19 is up here. So it's just a parabola like that, that just keeps going on forever. All right, so you can always check your graph and make sure that it makes intuitive sense with the function you're given. Well, notice how the parent function is x squared, it's a parabola, and this takes the shape of a parabola. And then the parent function x squared, it's shifted by two to the right and then three up. So we know the vertex from the parent function having the vertex of zero and zero, this transform function is gonna have a vertex at two and three. And notice how this one does have a vertex at two and three. And then it's also stretched by four. Here it's not as easy to tell that it's stretched. This uh, diagram is not necessarily to scale, but what that means is that it is thinner than the parent function x squared. It's been vertically stretched. So we can be pretty confident that this is the correct sketch for f of x. And in this question, we also have to sketch the inverse. So how would we do that? Well, for the inverse, what we can do is we could take our table of values for the function and then just interchange them. So the 0 and 19 would become 19 and 0. This 1 and 7 would become 7 and 1. 2 and 3 would be 3 and 2. Then we would have 7 and 3. And then we would have 19 and 4. And now we have a table of values for the inverse, and then we could just plot those points. And one thing I want to mention is notice that for part A, when we're sketching the inverse, we don't need the equation of the inverse. We don't need to find the equation. All we have to do is we have to find the table of values for the function and then just interchange the x and y values. In fact, part B is where we have to find the equation of the inverse. So that's one thing I want to mention is you don't need the equation of the inverse to make the table. You just need the table for the function, interchange the x and y values, and then you have a table of values for the inverse and you could sketch those points. So these points are going to be a little tougher to sketch. So we got 19 and 0, which is over here, let's say, 7 and 1, we'll say it's like right here. 3 and 2 is over here, and then we'll have 7. Remember this uh, y, uh, x value was 7 here, so 7 and 3 would be up here, and then 19 and 4 would be up here. So notice how it's going to be a sideways parabola. It sort of looks like a V in my sketch. But uh, yeah, you get where I'm coming from. So basically, we took this f of x, interchanged the x and y values, and we ended up getting this. And another way, if you remember, to think about the inverses is that it's just a reflection in the line y is equal to x. So if we take a line y is equal to x, and we take f of x and we reflect it over that line, we would end up with this sideways parabola right there. Next part of the question, part b, is we have to find the equation of the inverse. So the way you do that is you take your original function, and instead of putting f of x, I'm going to put y here. So we got y is equal to 4 bracket x minus 2 squared plus 3. And then to find the equation of the inverse, what you do is you switch the x and y. So now we'll have x equals 4 bracket y minus 2 squared plus 3. And you isolate for this y. Right? So the process for that is we bring this positive 3 over. So we'll have x minus 3 equals 4 bracket y minus 2 squared then divide both sides by 4. Remember, our goal is to get this y by itself, so we have to take away as much stuff from the right side as possible. First, we have to bring the 3 over. Now we're going to divide both sides by 4. 
So now we have x minus 3 over 4 is equal to y minus 2 squared. So let's actually write that out. So x minus 3 over 4 equals y minus 2 squared. And now the next step is we have to get rid of this exponent 2. So what we would do is we would square root both sides. Okay, because the square root of something squared is just equal to that something. And that something in this case is this bracket y minus 2. So if we continue this up here, what we're going to have is the square root of x minus 3 over 4 is equal to y minus 2. And then to isolate for this y, all we do is we bring this negative 2 over. So let's um, actually let's just keep it like this. So x minus 3 over 4. And then this, when you bring this negative 2 over, this plus 2 is not going to be under the square root sign. It's going to be um, separate from it. And then that's going to equal y. And then if you want to make it look nicer, so then the inverse, right, that's the notation for the inverse, the y value of the inverse, is equal to the square root of x minus 3 over 4 plus 2. So that's your answer right there. And in fact, you can actually check your answer with that table of values that you made for the inverse in part A. So what you can do is remember we had a bunch of x values for the inverse and then a bunch of corresponding y values. You could plug some stuff in and see if it works out. So for example, I remember we had one of the coordinates was 19 and 0 and another one was 19 and 4. Well, if we plug in 19 for x, we'd have 19 minus 3, which is 16. 16 divided by 4 is 4. And then the square root of 4 is plus or minus 2, right? So you're going to have two cases. So minus 2 plus 2 is 0. So that coordinate 19 and 0 we know is legit. And then the other case, the square root of 4 is positive 2. Positive 2 plus 2 gives us 4. And the other coordinate was 19 and 4. So what you can do to check this equation, if you've made a table of values before, is you could plug in some of the x values from that table and make sure you get the corresponding correct y value. And usually when you're dealing with the parent function x squared and you're finding the inverse of it, you're going to have this square root. And remember, there's going to be two cases um, for the y values when you're dealing with the inverse because the square root can be plus or minus. Hence why you get that sideways parabola shape and then you're gonna have multiple y values for the same x value. But anyway, this is the equation of the inverse. Part C, is the inverse a function? Well, if you remember, when we graphed the inverse, this is gonna be a very rough sketch, it looks something like that, right? And I think that the vertex was at like three and two. So, is the inverse a function? Well, it's not, because if we run a vertical line through it, notice how the vertical line is touching multiple y values for a single x value. So, the answer to this question is that it's not a function. And then it asks you to explain, and you can explain it in two different ways. First way, you can say it doesn't pass, the vertical line test and if you want to be a little bit more specific you can say that there are multiple y values for a single x value so like if we take an x value here notice how this x value is going to have multiple y values or if you want to be even more abstract you can say there are multiple dependent variables for a single independent variable. But I think just saying there are multiple y values for a single x value. If you say both of these things, 
and it doesn't pass the vertical line test, then I think you should be okay. Next, we have to state the domain and range of the inverse. So I kept the sketch from part C. And all you need for the domain and range of the inverse, if the parent function is x squared, is the coordinates of that vertex. So the domain is going to be what? Well, notice how x can be anything, but only if x is greater than 2, right? This x value of the vertex is at 2, so all of the x values have to be greater than or equal to 2. And then the range, notice how there's no restriction on the y values. These arrows keep going on forever, so the y values can be anything. So the range is y is an element of real numbers. And actually, as Another remark, if you remember our original function, this is not to scale by the way, the parabola looks something like this and the vertex was at 3 and 2. So if we just look at the function, so let's label everything here. So this was the domain and range for the inverse, which is what the question was asking us. So that's the answer to the question but I just want to show you something. So this is the original function. What is the domain for the original function? Well, notice it's XER. The domain for any regular parabola is always going to be X is an element of real numbers. And then the range, notice how the Y's can be anything but the y values have to be greater than or equal to that y value of the vertex of 2. So that's the domain and range for the function. And notice how for the inverse, if you remember this relationship from the lecture videos, the domain and range for the inverse is switched from the function. So notice how the domain for the function is XER and then the range for the inverse is yer. The range for the function is y is an element of real numbers and y has to be greater than or equal to 2. And then the domain of the inverse is x is an element of real numbers and x has to be greater than or equal to 2. So not only are you interchanging the x and the y values from the function to the inverse, you're also interchanging the domain and ranges. So just take note of that. Yo, what's up guys? Thanks for checking out my channel. Hopefully you got some value from the video you just watched. If you did get some value, big favor to ask you, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. Any questions, any recommendations on things you'd like to see, please leave it in the comments section. Also check out the description box below for links to material and content related to the video you just watched. Peace out.